All right, guys, welcome back to another episode. So today we're going to be checking out some more work from Thomas Sowell. And uh, the piece that he is going to be talking about is black culture. And it says black culture keeps blacks down. This is why. This is a conversation that we have had, as well as many other people have had, uh, where, when we are discussing or coming to terms with what is considered black culture and what it has done to black people in America. And also what we're seeing um, about black culture being spread all, all around the world. Because as we've seen with black people from uh, all over the diaspora, they are gravitating to more and more towards American black culture. And so hmm. um, I, I do want to get his perspective and his take on this, and then maybe we can discuss some of the topics. Okay. All right. So, guys, leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. Let's go ahead and jump into this video. Uh, let's go. The culture in which they grew up with was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. So they had... There's no gangster rap. In, uh, uh, that, that, that was pervasively uh, uh, available in Germany. That's exactly what we was talking about. It, <laughs> <clears throat> it's not being black. It's a way of life. Unfortunately, the way of life is being celebrated not only in rap music, but amongst the intelligentsia. It's a way of life that leads to a lot of very big problems for most people. Wow. Thomas Sowell. Yeah, Thomas Sowell. This is exactly I what I mean, talking about. The, the average of, of black kid today, I think, is probably uh, better off, certainly materially, than, uh, say, ben, ben Carson was when he was growing up. Ben Carson, the famous uh, black surgeon Carson. at Johns Hopkins. Right, right. Uh, Who I mean, is immensely accomplished in every way. Yes. Right. Uh, I would say that um, certainly the black kids who uh, are growing up today have a higher material standard of living than I had. Uh, the only the diff difference was that uh, the schools were good when I came along. They were especially good in New York at that time, hard as that is to believe. Mm. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the kids who grew up that, in that same place where I lived, they will not get that same education. Mm. Now that can be blamed on somebody, but it has very little to do with what happened uh, 100 or 200 years ago. And it's true in other countries. I mean, uh, in Nigeria, for example, there's a tribe, the Igbos, who are living in one of the least, least fertile parts of Nigeria, uh, who were in fact enslaved uh, in centuries past by other tribes and so on. Uh, when, when the British moved in and set up schools, the Igbos went for the schools. By the time Nigeria became uh, independent, the Igbos had climbed above the other groups that had been ahead of them to, uh, to begin with. So there, but there are all kinds of uh, cross currents of factors uh, the particular culture, or the particular geography, you run through the whole list of them. Here's, you cite, in Intellectuals and Race, you cite an observation by the intelligence expert, IQ scientist, James Flynn, that just stopped me cold. Mm. After the Second World War, you've got large numbers of, of American troops remaining in Germany. For mm. that matter, mm. there's still several tens of thousands there today. And both black and white American soldiers had children with German women. Mm. And Flynn discovered that those children growing up in Germany mm. showed no IQ differences at all. Mm. The, the, the black kids and the white kids, the same. Quote, quoting intellectuals and race, Professor Flynn concluded that the reason was that the offspring of black soldiers in Germany, and now you're quoting Professor Flynn, grew up in a nation with no black subculture, Ooh, yeah. close quote. Mm. Which means what? Which means they experienced exactly the same expectations? Is this the they No, 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 the expectations are external. The culture in which they grew up with was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. Right. So they had- There's no gangster rap. In, uh, uh, that, that, that was pervasively uh, uh, available in Germany. So here's what I'm getting. There is something about black subculture in America today mm. that holds African-Americans themselves back? Yes. In <laughs> fact, I, 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 I went know, into this. In a what this reminds me of, mm. T.I. son, King. Oh, yes. And how T.I. was kind of like upset that his son was kind of perpetrating 
uh, a lifestyle hood, that he culture. never lived. And his son was like, I know you, I know you, and I had to grow up in the trap, and this, that, and the third, and you wasn't around. And T.I. is telling him how privileged he was. Like, right. you don't know what you're talking about. But the perspective that T.I. isn't seeing is other people's kids that his music influenced um, right. who who feel the same way. Like, the culture isn't, the music isn't just entertainment. It is pervasive in the culture to where maybe you do have some type of privilege, but you like to live in an existence where that culture is victimhood because victimhood is celebrated within the black community yeah i was no i mean that's just i mean that's what it it is what it is and so i a a lot of people start talking about it and how their children represent hoods that they're not even from right and then they're shocked and i'm like how are you shocked like you listen to the music and you think it's surface level why they right. feel like they're living this life even though they have privilege but because we make it like cool or we, uh, we, we create, part of the struggle right. and you know all of these things it's like why wouldn't they think this the life they live you we made it part of the culture right i think um it's exactly as he as uh, as he was saying was that uh, black people create an identity around uh, this culture of victimhood, and now it's celebrated as black culture. And it's funny that he mentions gangster rap because black people will see things that are associated with hip hop. Um, and then identify it as authentically being black. If you're a black person in America, you have to do this or you have to do that. It's not cool to get an education. It's cool to act a certain way, to walk and sag your pants and everything. And it's very interesting how... Even though that's not your life. Right, even though that's not your life. Even if you came from an upper middle class or a middle class family, two-parent household, you still have to act a certain way in order to be considered black. And it's funny how he was saying that in Germany, where they don't have gangster rap or hip hop or anything like that, the 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 they had to create their own sense of identity, of blackness within um, that society. But let's continue. Previous uh, book on which. Uh, uh, about bl- black rednecks and white liberals, because that same let's, subculture. We'll, we'll, let's talk about two of your books here. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Because, because that very sub- same subculture held white whites in the South back as well. That in the time this this uh, mental testing in the First World War turned up among other things the fact that uh, whites from various oh four or five southern states scored lower on the mental test than than blacks from four or five northern states. And so it really was a question of the subculture that was there, which was a handicap to both. Hmm. All right. Wow. And so whose job is it to say, wrong subculture, folks, you're, har- you're harming yourselves? Well, I would think in an ideal yeah. world that intellectuals might take on that task. But uh, the world that we live in, I've noticed, is not, not ideal. All right. <sighs> what is to be done? Take a look at President Lyndon Johnson speaking at Howard University in 1965. (laughs) But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Hmm. It's, It's pathetic. It's not a question of, there's no you who has the control to be completely fair or completely unfair. 
I mean, the circumstances are, so someone went, once criticized the mental test on grounds that the tests were unfair. And, uh, what, and I think it was David Reisman who said, the tests are not unfair, life is unfair, and the tests are measuring the results. Mm. But who has control of life? Who has control of the past? Who has control of the culture that people have in the present, which they've inherited from the past? Mm. So Lyndon Johnson, he's in fact, although good liberal that he was, at least in regard, Lyndon Johnson had a complicated career and changed positions on issues many times, but good liberal though he was at that moment, he was in fact engaging in a breathtaking arrogance. Yes. On two counts. One, that white people were the ones who were responsible for where black people stood in the race, mm. that it was up to whites entirely, that blacks, as he described, I'm, I'm putting this to you, it's, 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 it's black people are passive, they're acted upon. That's right, that's right. And then the second act of arrogance is the supposition that somehow the federal government could fix it. Yes, uh, it, it, it is staggering. Uh, but if, if you wanted to be charitable, you could say, well, he said this in 1965. But if you say, all right, why are people now repeating it in 2013 when we've had uh, uh, nearly half a century uh, of experience to the contrary? And if you look within the black community, those blacks who had escaped what I call the black redneck culture, they've moved on. Mm. So, but it is, it's, in, it's, 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 it's the culture that different parts of the black community had. They were, they were different. Mm. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in his famous 1965 report entitled, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, close quote. Longish, longish quotation, but it gets to something, I believe. Moynihan, the fundamental problem is that of family structure. The Negro family in the urban ghettos is crumbling. A middle class mm. has managed to save itself, mm. but for vast numbers of the unskilled and poorly educated, the fabric of conventional social relationships has all but disintegrated. So long as this situation persists, the cycle of poverty and disadvantage will continue to repeat itself." Close quote. When Moynihan wrote those words, the illegitimacy rate among African Americans was 25%. Mm. Today, oh the illegitimacy God. rate I'm among scared. white Americans is 36 percent. Among Hispanics, more than 50 percent, and among African Americans, Ooh, more than 70 percent. Damn! I knew it was coming. I knew oh it was coming. Oh my goodness! Ooh. So, what do you think about that? How did we get here? Yeah. Because that is so many people have explanations mm. as to why the family structure in the black community has broken down. Right. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know why. I think it's, it's become rooted in black American culture. It's become rooted in black American culture for, um, for men to uh, have multiple baby mamas, um, to not take care of their children. Um, why? to yeah, for a lot of that, but why? and there, 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 there's, but and, and you're right. There's a lot of things that people talk about. They talk about how how uh, women they wouldn't receive government assistance if there was a man, man in the house, household. so that the federal programs incentivized for men to leave. But, but there was also a good majority you, of the men who just didn't want to be there in the first place. But what doesn't make sense? Okay, think about it. You incentivize the man not being in the household. What man in his right mind would leave his family instead of getting a job and, and just try, and both at of y'all working? Right. Both of y'all working. So it implies that does it imply that the men couldn't get the jobs and so right. therefore in order for his family to eat, he had to he leave. He had to leave. Right. So, so that's the complicated thing about this, because then there was the situations where um, black communities were being over policed, and then we were coming to find uh, uh, thirty, forty years later how um, these were designed 
to incarcerate black men and put them in jail so that they couldn't raise their families, even for the ones who wanted to. Mm. And so it's very complicated because there is legit accountability for men not wanting to raise their families or women not wanting the man to be a part of their lives or children's lives. But then there's also government interference or oh, okay. police interference. Okay. Because I've it's very seen complicated. people have this conversation yeah. and most black men blame black women. Right. Um, they say it's because of feminism. Okay. Um, they also say it's because, you know, the women didn't want the men in the household. Right. And they also say that in the 80s, the women were like, we don't need a man. And then that continued into the right. 90s and the 2000s. And women were instead encouraged to get degrees instead. Right. Um, Which is but, interesting because for me, the m most excuse I, would, uh, I always heard was the police or the man's trying to keep me down. Or I can't do this because or things didn't work out because the government is out to get me or things mm -hmm. like that. I mean. We've heard it all, all throughout our lives. And so, it, and so as a black person and you're hearing it, it's kind of like which one is true? But then, okay, but incorporate your life experience into that. And I know everybody's case might be different. Yeah. But So when I put my life experience, when I put what I've seen throughout my life in, in, in that picture of black men that I've seen raising their families or abandoning their families. Because your dad stuck around. Right. But His it was, dad did the damn thing. Right. But it's all for my life experience, it's always been a mixture. Mm -hmm. because. But I'm talking about your life. I'm not talking for about me? other. I'm talking about incorporating your life experience because I know some people are going to like you you can't incorporate your life experience within the sea of what's going on but I I think you can to get gain a different perspective because you come from a big family you come from a family that works hard you come from a family where they made sacrifices and your dad was around and I come from the opposite. Okay. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, the reason my dad was around, wasn't around was, and he made the statement, he was not a good person. Mm. You know, to me, that's not an excuse not to do what you, not to take care of your responsibilities. Right. right. And his mom kind of had to step in right. a lot of times. But what I see is an excuse for that some of the men make. Right. And that's not and, always and, the case. But right. in some cases, I don't think it's all the women. Right. And to, to place it on all the women makes it seem like, well, women have to take – complete accountability right because uh maybe they're the leaders of our community so <laughs> within the black community there is and there are issues of self-accountability and that's why i was saying what makes this situation so complicated yeah because then men say well women need to choose better and but then, then there's like and then they choose to uh say instead let me uh, get a better life. Let me get an education. Um, let me do these things so I can have a better life for my children. And then it becomes harder to find a mate. Right. Uh, because you've neglected that part. Right. And it makes it seem like you can't do both. I mean, it's a complicated. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's, it's a, a complicated yeah. situation, but from. The rhetoric that I hear, and it's internet rhetoric, and you can't just take that for fact, um, but they make it seem like it's such an easy solution. Right, it, and it's not. And it's, the problem is just the women. You're right, and it, it's not. It, it, it's not a pull yourself up by a bootstrap solution. 
But um, but let's go ahead and, and continue. And uh, well, and that's not the solution that that's on the internet. What they're saying that women need to choose better, and um, yeah, and and that's what I'm saying. What makes the situation so complicated because so when all you, them when you wrong? because when you say women need to choose better and there's not better out there, then that's what are what you t- what are you talking about? You know what I mean? And so that's something that we hear all all the time. And now we're coming to a point of where um, women are uh, graduating at higher rates than black men. So when you say choose better, the the pool of better is incredibly small. But here's what I'm saying. If you tell black women to choose better, but then also say, well, we was incarcerated at record rates and this was pumped into our neighborhood and this, this happened to all these black men, it's like, like you said, then the pool is smaller of black men to choose from. And then we know that women outnumber right. men. Mm-hmm. And so it don't make any sense. That that statement for me doesn't make any sense. And I know we're going to get some people still regurgitating the same do better, right. choose better. And uh, I think the path that women were on because they couldn't maybe find a mate. Mm. They decided to get an education in hopes of that bettering yeah, of their that, life. Right, uh, right, of that being a criteria of being able to choose better. Because for a woman, you would say, how can I better my situation? How can I choose better if I'm not better myself? Right. And that was something that women had always equated with being able to get a better mate. I can get a better job, I can get a better education, and that way I can get a better man. Yeah, I can and be what, in a better place. And what people. they've come to find is that, that that's, that's not, not necessarily it. true. Right. And that's because of our interpersonal relationships and social dynamics, especially in America. Well, it, it the studies show that the more educated a black woman is, the more likely um, she's not gonna get married. Yeah, exactly. Right. Social <laughs> social dynamics. It, and I think it's because the new pool of men she has to choose from because you said that black men aren't getting um, degrees as fast as women. Right. But it's not ne- it's not necessarily that. Okay. But it's what men value as far as what they're looking for in a potential mate. And it's not a degree. And it's not a degree or education. But anyway, that's a whole different conversation. But let's go <laughs> ahead and finish finish up with this one right here. Aside from throwing up your hands in despair, what, how, what, what is to be done? First, the first thing to be done is to understand that this was a result of policies begun in the 1960s. This is not a legacy of what happened 100 years before the 1960s. The breakdown of the black family is not a legacy of slavery. No. If you, uh, the, the, the classic study of this goes all the way back to the era of slavery. And they find that Can most... I uh, Can I say this? Uh, well, oh, well, did no, you want to wait okay. for him to finish his uh, thought? Okay. Black kids, even under slavery, had lived with two, with two parents. And that was true all the way up until the 1960s. Uh, and so you, if you really want to find out what has happened, what's changed, it has changed since the 1960s. And the fact that, that, that whites now have a higher rate of illegitimacy than blacks had when Moynihan wrote suggests that this is uh, something that spreads out. But, but if you look at something else, if you look at those blacks, and look at black husband-wife families, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, poverty rate among such families has been in single digits ever since, every year, since 1994. So, and so, so, we, so if you look, at the, you look at the external causes, why the, 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 the husband-wife families and the uh, welfare single-mom families all are, are facing the same uh, society and objective things, but the, but the results are radically different because the cultures and values are different. So you would, you would roll back welfare. I guess that's the principal policy. You, 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 let's, okay, so what would Tom Sowell do? One, you'd, roll, you'd eliminate welfare, you'd reform welfare. What would you do? Roll it back. All right. And what about affirmative action? Eliminate it. Just gone. Yeah. Colorblind yeah. policy completely. All right. 
What prospect oh, for that happy. do you see? <laughs> None. No black, no black leader of any standing. I'm talking about a political leader as opposed to an intellectual such right. as yourself. You've got, well, there's you, there's Walter Williams. Uh, is there, do you get the sense that there's a, that that there's a growing generation, a rising generation of African-American intellectuals who say, enough of this, I'm with Tom Sowell? Well, I don't know if they'll go that far. There's no point <laughs> that being, would be asking a lot. Being, there's no point being reckless. <laughs> but but uh, I, I think uh, there are people like, like uh, Shelby Steele and many others, uh, Larry Elder, you run through a long list. And there are more such, pe more such people now than there were, say, in the 1970s. But in terms of political leaders, all the, all the incentives politically are for, for black leaders to blame all problems in the black community on the larger society. Mm. And that enables them to take on the role of being the defender of the black community right. against enemies, right. which in turn uh, creates the situation in which many blacks don't feel that anything that they do is going gonna, is gonna to help themselves mm. unless it's done politically as, as a group, right. that there's no point. I mean, why, why would you, if you believe what, the, what, that's what they say, why would you want to knock yourself out in the school knowing that the man is not going to let you get anywhere? Mm. Well, I, one of the most pathetic things I heard in recent years was a young black man saying that, you know, at one point he thought he would join the Air Force and become a pilot. And then he says he realized that the white man is not going to let a black man become a pilot. He and he try. was saying this decades after the Tennessee Airmen had established their reputation in combat in Europe, you know. But he, but the hopelessness, hopelessness is, is one of the big products of the of the race industry. Mm. That that you have you have no chance. I remember giving a talk at Marquette, and at the end of the talk, among the questions that was asked, a young again young black man got up and he said, even though I am graduating from Marquette uh, University. What hope is there for me? And uh, having gone through college when I was in the 50s, I don't remember any blacks saying that in the 1950s, when there was a lot more obstacles to overcome right. than wow. there were when this guy is graduating from Marquette. But you, but you have to pr pr produce that kind of feeling in order to serve the interests of those in the race industry. Final question then. Maybe we can, maybe we can think in terms of that young man at Marquette. Or let, let's put it this way. Somewhere, watching this interview, there's a young Thomas Sowell. There's an African-American who's smart and wants to do something with his life. What's, it se seems to me I've al we've already got one piece of advice you'd offer to him is stay away from the, from the races industry. Stay away from the what, race what hustlers. What advi at race hustlers. What advice would you give a young Thomas Sowell? How do you make something of yourself? as an African-American in America today? The way anybody else would. You equip yourself with skills that people are willing to pay for. Oh. Very good. Yeah, very good. Very insightful. Yeah. And that's something that we, we, like everything in this conversation is something that we talk about all the time, especially being black people in America and, and, and our perception of society. And what you can do as a black person to get ahead, because there are hurdles. Um, there's a lot of things that black folks have to deal with outside of society, but also internally mm -hmm. within our own um, circle. Because there is that feeling of, of victimhood. That's something that's very hard for black people to let go because just like he said about the young gentleman you will want to do something like become a pilot and you just be like nah. and no nah, because the white man's not going to let me become a pilot so you don't even try so you don't even try you don't even get give it give the white man a chance to tell you no because it's already in your head that he's going to stop you and it's like it might not even be a white man that's in charge of that. And, and, and that's exactly what he was saying at the end of the video. He was saying, equip yourself with the skill that people will need. We need pilots. 
We need doctors. Well, we need lawyers. We need people who can do these things. And if you can do that and no one else can do that, no one can stop you from doing it. Because why would they stop you from being a pilot if we need pilots? Mm. And so that's something that we talk about all the time, especially with the introduction of AI uh, and, and, and technology that's going on, that these are opportunities for black people to take advantage of because certain things, uh, the way society is changing so fast, there are certain jobs, there are certain things that people need and they can't deny you if you're talented in those areas. I think the culture though, it kind of promotes an alternative lifestyle. It does, exactly. And I think overall <laughs> that's what this video was about. It was about black culture in general and that's what's really holding you back. Keeping not the hold, man. Right, exactly. That's what's holding people back. Because instead of saying, you know what? Instead of being a pilot, instead of being an engineer, instead of being a doctor, a lawyer, I want to be a, a rapper. rapper. I want to be a stripper. I want to be a basketball player. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, and so that is actually what's celebrated all throughout the black community. And 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 so it's kind of like, oh well. The man ain't gonna let me be a, a, a pilot, so I'm gonna do this. And the, the area that you choose to operate in, that you wanna have your career, is like a low probability position or a low pro probability thing. Like, it's a low probability that you're gonna be a successful rapper or, or even make it to the NBA, the NFL, or some shit, you know? But it's it, 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 and the man will stop you doing that, <laughs> you know, because you hear you hear rappers say the same thing. I, I, I should have been famous, but the man ain't trying to pay me. Very interesting. Very it, interesting. It makes you ponder and having these conversation, it really heats people up. Um, but they're conversations and, that people need to have, whether you agree with them or disagree. You, but here's the thing. The biggest problem I have with our culture, black culture, is if you deviate from what's the norm, you're shut down. Right. If That's you, an obstacle. If you say, for instance, you might vote a little bit differently because your values are conservative. You have to vote the same, you have to act the same, you have to talk the same. Mm -hmm. Anything that deviates from what is traditionally hip hop culture, which is not our entire culture, by the way, which right, as it's a, a recent, yeah, as a recent hip hop is just the culture, right. um, which is ridiculous. But it's like we love to say we're not a monolith, but as soon as somebody is different, right. it's like you are. A bad person. Right. You're a bad representation you, you, of black you people. You aren't black, and we're going to trade you and right. all of the, these things. And it's like, why should we all think the same? Why should we all act the same? Mm. Um, and, and that's another thing that I feel is holding us back as a people. Group think. Group think. Yeah. And so what I was saying before about not even going as far as you having a different opinion as far as your political agenda, but we learn this at a very young age when you go to school and you see how people will treat you when you're, you're, you're in class and you do schoolwork. Oh, oh, you the smart one. It's not cool to be smart. Oh my God. And it's so, about the tennis shoes you yeah, have on, the, the clothes. tennis shoes you have on, the clothes you have on. It starts at a very, very young, young age. age. Yeah, very young age where you kind of get indoctrinated within black community. School is not about school or black culture. Yeah, it's not about school. And so, rather you doing your schoolwork, you're caught up in trying to fit in. Yeah, and it's only natural that children want to fit in within their circle. Yeah, you know, but. It's definitely harming. So this is a conversation that we would love to continue to have. Guys, leave be your thoughts down below in the comment section. Of course, be respectful. Um, yeah, like, share, and subscribe. And stay tuned for more uh, 
conversations. Anyway, we'll see you guys next time. Take care.